you know, as the, the name of the session is Brand India and Soft Power, I will not waste time and straight away ask questions to Mr. Khan. He doesn't need any introduction, but what is a soft power? How is it different from hard power? Prime Minister Narendra Modi has used parts of hard power, parts of soft power, which we call smart power. Is it Vasudev Kutumbakam? Is it Incredible India, the man who is sitting here who made the campaign? Or is it about Samman, Samvad, Samriddhi, Sanskriti, Evam Suraksha, which is part of our approach? Is it spirituality? As Barun very rightly pointed out, is it about that attractiveness, uh, pride in India's ancient past, which is part of the Prime Minister's public diplomacy? Is it cultural circuit? Is it Ramayana circuit? Is it diaspora politics? Or is it plain, simple developmental work of Indian government, which is making schools, dams, not putting boots on ground? It's democracy, not dictatorship. So let me begin straight away, sir. You shepherded G20. Was it soft power? Was it hard power? Or was it smart power? I think it was a blend of uh, both the soft and the hard power. Uh, the soft power in terms of uh, doing the G20 in over over 220 different cities of India, doing it uh, in several uh, states of India, almost all the states and union territories of India, uh, going back and uh, using all our inherent cultural uh, content. Every state brought its great uh, art, culture, music all together, and ensuring that we are able to improve our cities during G20 in terms of drainage, sewage, solid waste, and also project India as uh, Vasudev Kutumbakam, that is uh, one earth, one family, one future. Because of our civilizational strength, that is we may be, you know, the whole world may have different political ideologies, may have different uh, political leanings, different geographical boundaries, but we all come from one cosmos, and that cosmic power we use to, weigh, uh, to really differentiate India from the rest of the world during G20. Sir, I want to spend some more time on G20, and of course, you have literally shepherded the whole G20 initiative, and in fact, it went well beyond a festival. Festivals have a start time and an end time, and streets are decorated for a while. But look at New Delhi right now, for example. We are still dotted with G20. G20, thanks to you, has pretty much become part of the DNA of the country right now. Now, I want to understand from you in the context of soft power, is soft power anything more than great packaging over a product that already is robust? So, you know, it's, uh, soft power is a concept which was used by an American professor. 1990. Yeah, Joseph Nye, and he used it uh, to say that it's not America which is famous because of its hard power, because of its economic strength, but it's famous because of its uh, huge ability to have an impact on the minds of people across the world. And that's because of the brands it has created. In the Indian context during G20, we were able to straddle different worlds. We were able to bring G7, together, we were able to bring all the emerging markets together, we were able to bring Russia, China all together. On all 83 paras, bring consensus on all paras. It demonstrated India's great ability to work with all countries of the world and bring consensus. You know, the important thing about multilateral is nothing works without a consensus. To bring consensus on issues of development, on issues of sustainable development. Would you call it diplomacy, sir? Would you call it soft power? What is that thin line between diplomacy and soft power? So the thin line was, uh, it was a great combination of India's hard power. The fact that India was growing at rapid rates, it was a great combination of unique political leadership. If it wasn't for the stature and uh, the great standing of the Prime Minister, it would have been very difficult to get uh, consensus in the Russia-Ukraine para. Uh, it was, uh, you know, the great hard power of uh, the fact that, uh, you know, we had demonstrated India's digital strength through the digital public infrastructure. 
You know, everybody has a digital identity. We do 46% of the real-time fast payment. The world accepted that India's, it's leapfrog technologically in many parts, many, many areas of growth and progress. Okay. You know, you, you, you made the Incredible India campaign. Uh, you rebuild the, the imagination around tourism. So there are two questions. One, uh, when we talk about soft power, what are its core? And the secondly, do you feel that we have gone beyond chicken tikka masala in context of, you know, imagining India in terms of food? <laughs> because ultimately food is also part of, you know, a greater lifestyle cultural projection when it comes to projecting the attractiveness of a country. So, you know, the important thing is that you need to differentiate yourself in whatever you do. Uh, so when I started working on Kerala as a destination, Kerala was known for one product, and which was the Kovalam Beach. And uh, we went back to... And the banana chips, sir. <laughs> yeah, banana <laughs> chips at that time. But Since we, you mentioned you know, chicken tikka masala. We, we went back to the roots of Kerala. We went back to its traditional products. We went back to the inherent strength of its backwaters. We went back to its houseboats where not a single nail is used. We went back to Ayurveda. We went back to its mother of martial arts, Kalri Pet. We went back to its traditional architecture, Nalkitam. Uh, houses uh, which have a unique spiritual strength. Uh, we went back, we restored all its traditional art forms from Tayyam to Kathakali to Mohini Atam. And later when I started, when I came here and did the Incredible India brand, uh, we went back to Ayurveda, we went back to yoga, we went back to meditation. So you need to different, there are 250 destinations competing with each other in the tourism marketplace. How do you differentiate yourself from the rest? You can never do it by aping the West. Sir, but in the context of India, sorry to cut you short, um, is that an opportunity or a challenge that we are so diverse? Is it easy or, I mean, I'm sure it's not easy, but is it even plausible to create a unique identity for brand India given the diversity? Yeah, so the challenge is that India is bigger than 24 countries of Europe plus another Yeah, so is it a challenge or an opportunity? So, so the challenge is that actually every state of India Every single state of India and the union territories of India have a unique opportunity to create their own brands in the global market space. And tourism can grow and prosper much like what Rajasthan has done, much like what Kashmir has done, much like what Kerala has done. If every state of India becomes a global tourism brand, India's tourism will grow by 10x simply by doing that. So, you know, tourism is the biggest job creator. Its multiplier impact is enormous. And every state of India must take this opportunity of really driving travel and So tourism. ODOP, should that now progress from one district, one product to one district, one tourism? Is there merit in considering a services-based argument for ODOP? So I don't think there's merit in uh, one district, one tourism, but there's definitely merit in one state, one tourism, because tourism is a private sector play. So, you know, from the time you arrive to the time you depart, you get in touch with a number of private sector players. So you need to work in cohesion with all of them. And therefore, you need to create state brands. And these are very large states. I mean, look at Uttar Pradesh. If it was a country, it would be the fifth largest country in the Absolutely. world. So, you know, you have enormous strengths of... Uh, I mean, Bihar, for instance, can be a great Buddhism destination. Uh, UP can be a great Ramayan circuit. True. Uh, even uh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand have tremendous potential. Mr. Kant, can you, can you take us through uh, the distinct effort made by Prime Minister Modi? A lot of Prime Ministers have addressed the issue of diaspora. There are two types of diaspora, economic opportunity diaspora, and one diaspora is a result of colonialism, indentured labor, uh, Mauritius, uh, Suriname, even Myanmar. These are the places where people remember what it meant to be an Indian in India, in Bharat. So when we look for the Bhartiyata, and I'm not using the word Indian, Bhartiyata, Prime Minister Modi made a, made a special effort in the last nine and a half years of his tenure to marshal that diaspora. How has that worked for creating a new brand Bharat and for marshaling those resources for betterment of Bharat? So one, uh, you know, let me first say that there's been an enormous, uh, huge, huge, uh, effort by the Prime Minister on his every single trip to mobilize, uh, to actually communicate one-to-one -one 
with India's diaspora and create a sense of pride, great sense of honor, a great sense of giving them the feeling that what India has achieved in the last nine years. And it's important to convey to them what India has achieved. You know, uh, that we have, we've done, you know, it's important to understand what India has done in terms of size and scale. We've done 40 million houses in the last eight years, which is like making one Australia. We've done 110 million toilets, which is like making one Germany. We've done 253 million piped water connection, which is like providing a piped water connection to everyone in Brazil. We've done 80,000 kilometers of road. That's three times the diameter of the earth. And we do 46% of the real-time fast payments in the world. Uh, you know, we did last year, we did 20, 126 billion real-time fast payment on the mobile, on the go. Uh, you know, without going to a bank or without go using an ATM machine, China was next with 26 billion. That was the difference. The difference was 105 billion between India and China. Now, how do you convey this? The Prime Minister has used this opportunity to actually communicate directly with Indian diaspora and they have now understood how India has grown and prospered. And that is why the Bank of International Settlements said that what India has achieved in the last eight years would have actually taken India 50 years to achieve. Now, you've conveyed that to the Indian diaspora through this communication, direct communication between the Prime Minister and the non-resident Indians. So, is that soft power, I want to come back to the subject, does soft power have the potential to exist minus hard power? And that brings me back to the packaging analogy that I had given you earlier. You've got to have a solid product that you can package and you can communicate. So, is the role of soft power limited to communicating the story of our achievements? So the important thing to understand is what the Prime Minister is saying, that we need to grow rapidly into a $10 trillion economy by 2035, become a $35 trillion economy by 2047. This That's is right. important. That's right. You know, that is, economic growth is critical. Economic growth is critical because you need to raise the per capita income of every individual. When you do that, automatically your hard power grows. Soft power is critical because you need to converge and integrate your hard power with your culture, your civilization, your music. I mean, look at what has happened in the Grammy Award. You had five, five Grammy Awards this year. Look at what Ricky Cage has done to India. All, I mean, Zakir won, th Zakir won three awards. Ricky Cage has been winning Grammy Awards. So these are the people who add to India's soft power. They are really the brand ambassadors of India. You know, Prime Minister has also defined, if I want you to take us through that, because the Prime Minister's understanding of soft power is also around India being a civilization state, a young country and an old nation. Uh, it also centers around uh, great pride in our ancient values. It's about Bharatiyata. Can you take us through that journey? You, you have been part of the Incredible India Project, Startup India Project, Make in India Project. It rests on one simple word, Bharatiyata. So there are two, th two dimensions to it. First of all, we must understand that we are a very young India. You know, the demographics of India are in our favor. That's our average age of the population is 28 right now. Even when we are 120, 47, the average age will be about 34, 35. Even then, we'll be the youngest nation in the world. Second is, that there is a huge civilizational strength to India. I mean, when India got colonized in 1700, India's contribution to global GDP was 24%. By the time we became independent, it had come down to 5%. What the Prime Minister is saying is that during our Amrit Kal period, we should accelerate the pace of our growth because we have very low dependency burden as far as demographics is concerned. That, to my mind, can never happen till you don't have a sense of pride, a great sense of honor about your own civilizational strength. That can never come from really copying the West and that means that you must have a sense of pride of your own culture, your own art, your own music, and actually saying that this is India's civilization. Every young Indian must have a sense of pride on its own civilization. And when you have that inherent strength, you will drive India's, India's growth story will be driven.
Sir, is pride enough? And I know that there is, of course, the $35 trillion target by 2047. You also just refer to that. Um, and you're saying that you need better growth, faster growth, to translate to better per capita income. But even at $35 trillion, you will have a per capita GDP, which would still be a fraction of what the developed world uh, you know, gives its people today, given the vast size of our population. Obviously, we have our challenges. And with those challenges, we've got to grow even faster than, despite being the fastest economy of the world, is not enough for a country like India. So civilizational strengths and attributes aside, there has got to be some scope of soft power, which I see being deployed by Prime Minister Modi, by the entire cabinet, um, and, and luminaries like you, who worked on the India story for so long, where even hard economic issues like GDP are now pretty much, you know, on the lips of every Indian. It's not something that was, it was construed as a very hardcore economic subject. Today, thanks to perhaps soft power, these very hardcore economic concepts are now absolute lexical usage. So just a couple of points. Uh, first, uh, uh, you know, if you're a $35 trillion economy by 2047 means that you would have taken the per capita income of every Indian to close to about $17,500. Compared to US, and which still no, has about $76,000 per capita GDP. Yeah. You see... Not comparing, just giving statistics. It's very important to understand that we are a country of 1.4 billion people. That means you would have transformed the lives of 1.4 billion people in the world. That's important. Second is that India has got into a lot of sunrise areas of growth. This has never happened historically. If you look at it, it's never happened in India's history that you've started looking at electric mobility, you've started looking at uh, battery storage, you're looking at sun semiconductors, you're doing mobile manufacturing. Apple and Samsung, I think yeah. they're producing so a lot more these, in India than China. All these new areas of growth. And the third very critical thing is that if you look at the last two decades, all technological innovations that come from the western part of the world, whether it was Apple, Google, Meta, Amazon, and in China from Tencent and Alibaba, what India did was to create this open source, open API, globally interoperable model by which everybody can do a digital transaction. The private sector competes uh, with global players. Phone pay competes with Google Pay here. And you have a number of unicorns. You have over 120 unicorns now giving you, they are, what are they doing? They are giving you wealth creation. 35% of your stock market is being created by Zeroda Gross Upstock. You have young startups like GoDigit and Aco who are giving you insurance in one minute. So what has happened is that in India, on the mobile, on the go, you can do fast payment, you can do wealth creation, you can do credit, you can do insurance all in 30 seconds to one minute. This doesn't happen anywhere in the world. Nowhere in the world does this happen. Okay. And nowhere in the world has any country, has any country lifted, uh, you know, what has, what has India done? It has lifted 25 million people above the poverty line in the last nine years. Nowhere in, else in the world has Absolutely. this happened. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions. One I have wrestled with. Is soft power a process or a product? And the second thing is, sir, if you, if you look at the soft power approach of India, often uh, we have seen that the soft power, because we have, uh, we have looked into the potentials of soft power in terms of branding. This question is, second question is also about the challenges. It fails to change the behavior of the neighboring state because of political instability. Look at Afghanistan. We built schools. We built Salma Dam. The behavior did not change. Uh, Prime Minister Atal Vihari Vajpayee's initiative of Kashmiriyat, free, free trade, movement of people, it didn't really much change the sentiment of the Pakistani army. Or the Act East Asia uh, poli uh, policy from Narasimha Rao to Act East Asia of Prime Minister Modi, now there's a fence coming up because the state is collapsing. So two questions, is soft power product or a process? And secondly, how do we deal uh, in this context of soft power that just doesn't change the behavior of our neighboring countries? So first of all, uh, you know, without getting into a theoretical proposition, let me say that soft power 
is both a process, because it's evolutionary in nature to build a brand is a time-taking process. And it eventually becomes a product. So India needs to build a lot of global brands. India needs to, uh, India's private sector needs to build a huge number of global brands so that they will add value to India's soft power in the long run. And the second, my response to your question is that we should continue to work very hard. We are living in a very complex neighborhood. No other country in the world has the neighborhood which India has in terms of Afghanistan, Pakistan, China. We should continue our efforts in good neighborly relations with everyone. And that is a process which will take time. And you will have, you will have political turmoil in neighborhoods all the time. Irrespective of this, we should continue to build person-to-person -person relationship. You know, before the session was starting, uh, both me, he's Karthik and I'm Karthike. You know, we were, <laughs> we, were, you know, we were talking about the investment which Prime Minister makes in context of tourism. You know, today he went for a deep sea dive at Beth Dwaraka, Sudarshan Setu. Prime Minister's investment in tourism is path-breaking. He makes it a point. Can you take us through uh, what are the reasons why he's making such a personal investment when it comes to our own country? And if I can just add one little uh, two cents to that question, are we likely to see tourism dawn the flavor of nationalism, hashtag Lakshadweep, or temple tourism, hashtag Ayodhya? So firstly, I don't think I've come across any speech of the Prime Minister where he hasn't dwelt at length on the, on the tourism aspect and the immense potential of tourism. And that is simply because he believes that the cultural strength, the civilizational impact, the tourism products which India has, no other country in the world has. And uh, he believes that this can be the biggest driver of India's growth it can be the biggest employment creator. For every direct job that you create in tourism, you create seven indirect jobs. So every state, and I repeat that, it's the biggest opportunity for job creation. India can create 25 million jobs in the next five years through travel and tourism sector. This is a potential which Prime Minister believes in and he's driving the states to push for tourism. And that is why, uh, you know, wherever he goes, his first focus is on travel and tourism. Sir, uh, can't refrain from asking, what is it going to take to literally build Lakshadweep, connectivity to Lakshadweep, the entire infrastructure in Lakshadweep, and really make it a real threatening challenge to a country like Maldives? So first and uh, foremost, uh, Lakshadweep is very, very fragile. Uh, it can't be mass tourism. Uh, the islands have very limited capacity. So you need to do carrying capacity of the islands, which Lakshadweep Island has done. It has bid out certain islands, defining the carrying capacity of these islands. We cannot make the mistakes which uh, Maldives has made, which Mauritius has made. Right. Our tourism there has to be very, very uh, carrying capacity based. It has to be very high value, low mass destination in these islands. We, it has to be based around sustainability. And sustainability has very, very high value in today's world. Mr. Khan, we are talking about soft power and not to talk about cinema would be a crime. Kind Absolutely. Of it would be a crime not to talk about cinema. So when we talk about soft power, what's the tip of the spear? Is it? Culture, yoga, Hollywood, food, tourism, how would you rate them, sir? So India's soft power is a combination of many factors. It's, uh, it's uh, cricket, uh, it's uh, India's unique uh, culture, it's Bollywood, it's uh, Tollywood, it's, uh, it's all your uh, great cinema from southern part of India, which is extremely creative and is brilliant. Uh, you know, some of the most outstanding producers, directors, all come from southern part of India, in addition to Bollywood, which is totally uh, astounding. Uh, but all this, India's traditional art forms, India's culture, all this combined together makes a very, very uh, powerful uh, soft power of India, all of this put together. And when you combine this with 
with the hard power of India, which is growing at about 7.3% and accelerating to 9 to 10%, this great combination of hard and soft power together is what drives India's growth story forward. Just one final question, sir, on cinema itself. Do you think, again, given the diversity that Indian cinema has, is it in our interest to create a brand India, brand Indian cinema, direct of the binaries of Bollywood, Tollywood, etc.? No, I don't agree with that. Okay. I don't agree with that because uh, Bollywood by itself is a very powerful brand. Uh, the uh, Tamil Nadu film uh, world is a very powerful brand. Uh, the Malayalam cinema is a very powerful brand. Telugu cinema is a very bra powerful can, brand. So is, there, can, so, no, is so, there no space for creating a unified Indian cinema identity? No, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like a mother brand being India and allowing the states to build their respective tourism brand, like uh, Kerala is God's own country. You know, the important thing we must all understand that there is a mother brand which is which is incredible India, as far as the tourism world is concerned. But we are a very large and country. You know, if you're bigger than 24 countries of Europe, the number of products are so vast and varied. Allow the states to build their own brands. And that's important. That's what the Prime Minister is saying when he goes to Gujarat. Allow Dwarka. Dwarka itself is a great brand. I mean, Ayodhya is a great brand. I mean, you can, Ayodhya can be one of the greatest uh, Ramayan circuit brands in the world. Why diffuse it? So allow each of these brands to be built. We should have the confidence of India to allow brands to be built globally. Competitive federalism in tourism. Competitive yeah. federalism the, in tourism. And on this note, I would like to thank you and, and say that I think the sum in total of things is that it's the combination of the hard and the soft power which has been done under Prime Minister Modi's tenure, which is smart power, no, is I, the most defining thing. Exactly. And, you know, it's never soft power in isolation. It's a combination of both economic growth. We should have the amb amb absolute ambition to grow at 9 to 10 percent to be a, for the next three decades, to be a 35 trillion dollar economy. Uh, we must build on our civilizational strength to build the soft power. And the third point that he made, make the states compete. The first year we did this in ease of doing business, Gujarat came number one. Next year, Andhra beat Gujarat. Third year, Telangana beat Andhra and Gujarat. But the good thing was that the mineral-rich states of Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, they scrapped a lot of rules, regulation to come fourth and fifth. And if the mineral-rich states of the eastern part of India start growing, India will grow not at 9 to 10%, India will grow at 11%. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir.